So yes, in the end, it wasn't Spectre, it wasn't Smirsh or Quantum, it was COVID-19 that brought Bond down. Oh, don't even start. You know, just Daniel Craig just goes down with the coronavirus straight away. This wouldn't even <laughs> have touched uh, Connery or Moore, any of them. Timothy Dalton would have given it a sharp look and said, don't you dare, and it would have been fine. <laughs> it would have bounced off Roger Moore's raised eyebrow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <sighs> But yes, uh, as ever when we plan something more than two weeks ahead, uh, the world has ended uh, with our Bond retrospective being hit by the fact that unless we do things very, very slowly, we are not, in fact, building up to no time to die in April. Hmm. So it's a slightly longer way off, isn't it? It's um... Yeah, it's November, a time of year when famously no one ever gets a cold. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh... I mean, the the joke that everyone's made is, ironically, we now have plenty of time to die, so there is that. We'll, <laughs> we'll just see how this thing shakes out. It's an interesting move, because just because nobody else has, has done it yet, no other um, studios have moved their film, have, have blinked and gone, mm. let's move this, um, which makes me think that maybe it's something to do with the plot rather than just to do with attendance in cinemas. I think, I think that, yeah. Yeah, like whatever Rami seems... Malek's up to, it might look suspiciously yeah. coronavirus-y. Everyone else seems pretty happy to take a wash on this, um, which you should do, preferably to the tune of <laughs> Happy Birthday to You. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yes, in, in we are continuing with our Bond retrospective on Cinema Eclectica. Uh, I'm Graham. This is Mark. Hello. And in the second half of the show, Mark will be uh, pressing on and doing his review of the beach. Do, should we call it the George Lazenby years? It feels like a bit of a trades descriptions problem to say years. Yeah, it's a bit one night only. Uh, we're going to cover 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service because despite the fact that No Time to Die is now in a few weeks, we're going to follow the example of another British franchise entry in the 1960s and carry on regardless. <laughs> yes. It would have been nice that yes. it come out in 69 as well, but I looked it up and didn't. Never mind. <laughs> it, it's strange that Carry On would avoid the most innuendo late in the year. <laughs> That's true. I don't think it's been invented then. Whereas in the future, <laughs> you know, kids will be asking, Father, why do we count 68, nice, 70? <laughs> yes. Uh, but before that, we have a look at Pixar's new film, Onward, mm. um, which is set in a once magical and brilliant world where everything has become subsumed in corporate blandness and depressing mediocrity. But enough about the Simpsons short that aired before this. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, we'll argue about that later. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is the new film from uh, Pixar's Dan Scanlon, who I think, did he do Monsters University? He did. Yeah, yeah. that was the last one he directed, yeah. Which I don't think anyone has really pulled out as a Pixar highlight, but this is what Pixar often do. They take someone who was directed a, a pretty safe sequel and they give them the money to do a, a more personal film, right? Yeah, I mean, by all accounts as well, this is this is a fairly personal project for Dan Scanlon as well because um, mm. he, like the main character, is... Uh, well, should we get into the story first and then talk about how it yeah. relates to... The... Yeah, let's do yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is about two brothers, uh, one with the you know fa fairly fantasy-ish name of Barley and one with the not-at-all fantasy-ish name of Ian. Yeah. Uh, who live in a... They are, they're sort of elves, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, they live in a suburb in a land that was previously magical, but has now become obsessed with convenience and gadgets when they come across an artefact from their father who died before Ian was born, which seems to promise them one more day with said late father. But it, it goes wrong, and I won't spoil how it goes wrong. If you've seen the trailers, you've probably seen this, but if you haven't, it's a pretty good joke. And they go on a quest to try and get that one last day with their father. 
Yeah, it's it's an interesting setup. I mean, the the first act of the film very much concentrates on setting up this um, this otherworldly realm, where, mm. where as you say, Graham, they're obsessed with gadgets. But it's the case of you know, magic exists and adventure exists. Electric electricity is just easier, uh, which means yeah. that a lot of people are just sort of chilling out, and you know, magic and adventure are now the province of hobbyists and geeks. Uh, so, for instance, <laughs> the older brother character Barley is well into his um, is. Uh, brand filed off Dungeons and Dragons analog, which in this world is <laughs> historically accurate. You know, it's, it's based yes. on, on stuff that really happened in this realm yeah. that people don't necessarily talk about anymore. So this quest that they go on is grounded in partly the tabletop game that he's playing. And just that's kind of where Pixar have gone with this because it feels as if the the latest Dungeons and Dragons film has been in development for a long, long time and Pixar has just mm. snuck in and kind of done, you know, in a post Lego movie world, what the best version of a Dungeons and Dragons film would be. It's someone going on a yeah. real quest using the the cards from their game in order to do it. And it's not mm. even a Dungeons and Dragons movie. It's just worked out quite nicely, really. <laughs> yeah, it's got a few sort of other IPs that orbit around it. I mean, I imagine that for a bit they were worried when there was a huge blockbuster announced with a similar premise and then probably relieved when they realised it was bright and everyone was going to forget it within three days. <laughs> there are vibes, yes, of, of Netflix's bright. Um, Shrek 2 jumps to mind as well, where you've got, you know, some not very creatively um, kind of um, medievally Rainy. branded, yeah, stuff yeah. like Burgershire now serving second breakfasts and Easter eggs like that. Um, but it being Pixar, um, I mean, for one thing, with the caliber of Monsters University, you might think that that's, that was kind of the way they were going to go, that it was just going to be sort of Shrek to, uh, you know, very softball. String gags. Yeah, like yeah. softball sight gags. And um, what gives this a little bit more of an underpinning is, as mentioned, for Dan Scanlon, it is um, a story that's very personal to him. Like the director himself lost his dad when he was very young. So it's the story mm. of a young a young man trying to connect with someone he's with, uh, with a father he's never known through this mm. fantasy setting and all the rest of it. it, it is very stirring, you know. Like, I mean, it, you can compare it to Shrek, but I can't think of anything in any of the Shrek films that's as affecting as when um, Ian is listening to a recording of his dad having a yeah. one sided phone conversation and tries to have that conversation with him. It's, it's touching, you know, and as you'd expect mm. from. It's almost like become passe to say Pixar just hits the tear jerker button at this point, but I did like yeah. the way this handled, handled itself, really. But the Shrek comparison is kind of interesting to me, and I don't want to like dump massively on Shrek, because I can still remember coming out of the first one and thinking, well, that was terrific, hmm. you know, before it became... A, a, it's somewhere between a cliche and a meme. And I guess they're yeah. kind of the same thing now. <laughs> yeah, the first um, one does stand up, but the second one, from the second one onwards, every single story is about Shrek unlearning the thing he learned in the first one in order to yeah. learn it again and make another one. So, you know, the second one's funny, but has that problem. So all the sequels do. The first one does stand mm. up, though. The main difference, I think, is, I mean, it's twofold, and it's in the way it treats its law, which is that Shrek is full of sort of postmodern gags about named fairy tales and fairy tale characters. And this isn't really. It has fairy tale monsters and fairy tale type stuff happening. But I saw, I knew it was going to click with me on that level when in the uh, pre credit sequence you see what the world was like back before gadgets were invented. And there's a bit with people stealing a chalice from a dragon. Hmm. And it's not being done to make a gag about The Hobbit or anything like that. Yeah. It's just, you're meant to recognise it as, oh yeah, that is a fairy tale type situation. I think there is an investment in the, the kind of feel and the texture and the ideas of fairy tales rather than just going, eh, three blind mics. Yeah, I mean it's it sets it fairly squarely. As I said, like without um, without it actually being a Dungeons and Dragons film, it does that tabletop stuff thing kind of stuff well. And I've seen like parents who have kids, and um, the parents themselves were once into you know D and D and that kind of thing, kind of mm. relishing the fact that their kids might now be interested in playing that sort of game through yeah. the you know through the way this goes. You know, as we've said, it does have like a bunch of different influences. I think the problem with the film that the film maybe has coming out uh, coming out now is that. You know, it's it's that Pixar grading curve 
that kind of brings yeah. any like Pixar does generally make very good films. It's like the exception of say like a few of the sequels they've made in recent years. Uh, Cars Two mm-hmm. is the one we can all agree is the worst Pixar film. Nice and easy. Yeah, there. It, it, was, it was good of them yeah. to make that and just find the bottom. Um, <laughs> there's plenty of you know for me this is like a four star film, but. Yeah, looking close to home, it being a film that deals with like grief and familial responsibility, it's immediately going to be compared to Coco, which kind of covers yeah. similar ground with losing a loved one, with losing a grandparent, in that case. And you mm. know, it's it's got that grading curve to run up. And as I say, without spoiling the plot, it's just as well really it brings an extra pair of feet to run up it. You know, this is, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's a, there's this weird comedic conceit running through it that sets it apart. It's it, as much as it's not as especially original film. It's mm. doing things distinctively. It's not trying to be Coco, basically. It's much more yeah, of yeah. a fantasy comedy type thing. But it, it, you know, when it does hit the tearjerker button, as people quite cynically put it, it is it is something that feels earned. It feels like it comes out of the it comes out of the story very well. It's it's not like a nuclear level weepy, but it's not trying to be. And the fact that it maintains the emotional component alongside the com- the comedic elements and the slapstick, I think, yeah. works really well. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I'd like to talk a bit more about the comedy because it, it some of my favourite performances in this are on the more comedic end. I mean, I think the the person who steals it for me, indeed the person who steals most movies she's in for me at the moment, is Octavia Spencer. Agreed. Uh, she plays a, a manticore whose tavern they have to go to as part of their quest, and they find out that since the map was written... Uh, that they're following, uh, she has turned it into a sort of kitschy family-free restaurant with a cuddly manticore who comes out and sings happy birthday to people. Yeah, the tavern's been it... kind of weather-spooned. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a really funny idea, but I-, I was thrilled that they keep on with it and find a way to build her into the story. Yeah, it's it's... It cleverly does that. It's not like just the throwaway sight gag type stuff that you expect from some of the Shrek sequels. It does build it into, it does build it into the plot. There's not really like a wasted moment in it. I would say. Mm, mm. Yeah, I'd agree. And it has this terrific cast, which, again, I was kind of worried when I saw the cast list because a lot of Pixar's best films have kind of avoided that typical celebrity voice plague that exists yeah. in other studios animations yeah. i saw the trailer for trolls 2 before this and um, <laughs> i was just reminded that my favorite pixar film is up where the most famous person in the cast is christopher Plummer, and he appears in the last third only yeah i mean if, if i'm not mistaken i think that um tom holland and chris pratt are the only pixar voice actors to get the above the above the title billing that Tom Hanks and uh, oh. Tim Allen got on Toy Story. I think it's just those four actors all together. Like even like John Goodman and Billy Crystal, like the Pixar brand was the above the title sell. So they don't yeah. do the, the DreamWorks thing. And you know, in this case, mm. from the marketing being what it is, where there's you know there's live action stuff in the adverts of Tom Holland and Chris Pratt going wearing onward, and it's uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> when you see it in the film, you know this being Pixar and getting the performances they get out of voice actors, there is mm. you know th- there's there's a lot more to it. You know, like. Um, I've mentioned um, the scene with Ian talking to his dad already. You know, up, you know, yeah. outside of that, you might think that Tom Holland's just doing his doing his Peter Parker from the Marvel movies again, and again finds a way to break out of it. And Chris Pratt like feels really comfortable as that sort of boisterous geek, and he's you know mm-hmm. driving a stoner's van around and uh, shouting at everybody a lot. Until well, you'll see where they go with this character. It just it works it works really well. But then you expect there's a Pixar. There is this is what I worry about with it is that. People sort of think, all right, but it's as good as the last time I raved about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is that element to it, I guess. You, you feel like a, a weird version of The Boy Who Cried Wolf, where in fact loads of wolves do turn up. It's just that people stop paying attention to you because they get bored with wolves. That's true. <laughs> there is, I mean, it is notable. I mean, it, feels, it would feel churlish to compare it against... Um, some of the, the studio's best films. I think it does stand up, though, to a lot of... This is the yeah. first original film in a few years, since Coco, in fact. I think in the last yeah. 10 years, I've had about four original films come out, of which is one of them. There's been a lot of sequels also, and prequels and spin-offs. And stuff it's like been that. Coco, Brave... Inside uh, Out. 
Inside Out and this, yeah. And The Good Dinosaur it, is also somewhere in there, but yeah, that's five oh, then. Yeah. But, but um, I, I do think that this genuinely, the thing I would say that over the last 10 years, this thing does right. It has the best third act of any Pixar film since Toy Story 3. I would go so far as to yeah. say, because like Coco, again, as I say, nuclear weepy, by the end of that, if you're not in tears, what are you? But it, <laughs> but at the same time, like with that, that kind of ends up, that kind of has a B plot running through it that sort of tugs one way while the emotions tug on the other, whereas this manages to embed it perfectly, just like all those sight jokes, just embeds it perfectly into the ongoing story between the two mm. brothers. And I think when there is, um, because it is a, it is an adventure story. It's mm. an adventure story that's heavily in inverted commas, but that is part of what they're playing with. And I think when it does have that heavier element of threat in the final reel, it's both visually really inventive and it doesn't get in the way of the more emotional material. It, uh, at one point, it literally frames it very nicely. Yeah, it's as I say, it's as exhilarating for me as any for the act of any Pixar film since Toy Story three. It does really come mm. through and marry those two threads brilliantly. And it, from the title down, it really gets you know onward being apparently the the name for one of the gears in um, uh, bit Barley's van. But yes. you know, it's but it's it's just such a, it's an adventurous approach to what the film's really about, which is grief and getting over the passing of a loved one. And I just found it really entertaining and exhilarating overall. That van is a star, by the way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there is normally something a bit unexpected that you come out raving about in a Pixar film. I did not go into up expecting to come out cheering about the dog. <laughs> I did not go into Inside Out expecting to be ranting and raving about the imaginary friend. Yeah. I think that van, in its own weird way, is this movie's bing bong. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, and and I really enjoyed the the level of planting and payoff in it. I mean, again, you have this aspect where it's not news to say Pixar really are very good at the whole storytelling business. Yeah. But everything in that first act, like right up to and including little banal set pieces like Ian trying to learn to drive, everything pays off later. Yeah, it's one. It's it's, it does feel like the most together of any of the films they've made in recent years, I would say. Yeah, just as I said, for me, mm. it's not a wasted moment. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, in terms of some of the rest of the cast, we've mentioned uh, Spencer, Holland and Pratt. Pratt, I think, is, is very Jack Blackish in this, isn't he? Yeah, I mean... <sighs> This is sort of, I mean, this is what, what I mean again when I was saying about the marketing for it. It's this sort of mm. caliber of animated character that, like, you feel like everything gets offered to Jack Black maybe at some point. Like, yeah, you feel yeah. like every movie has a role maybe that gets offered to Jack Black at some point in there. It's it's, it's odd that DreamWorks seems to bed them into everyone, and yet he doesn't turn up in every all of them. So you get people doing <laughs> their best Jack Black in some of these, for better yeah. or worse. Um, yeah, I mean, as I say, I think that. You know, it's it's a film that gets unlike some of the Chris Pratt's films, it gets that Whoopi Chris Pratt, even in animated form, is kind of is kind of better than the the Chris Pratt who has a chin. You know, the Jurassic World <laughs> Chris Pratt, the, the Chris Pratt who has a jaw. You know, like, like that. You know, it's like you, yes. you want the sort of the, the, the you don't want Star Lord. You know, when he's his most macho and all the rest of it. You want when there's a bit of vulnerability there. I would say, and this yeah. does it in spades. Yeah, completely, and uh, I was very happy to see Julia Lewis-Dreyfus there as yes. uh, giving, I think, a bit of cardigan-wearing mom representation. It, it's been a, a tough week for America's cardigan-wearing moms, <laughs> but this made me feel briefly kind of better about Elizabeth Warren dropping out from the Democratic presidential race. Oh, wow. Agreed. Again, I mean, I just I'm I'm still a bit raw on any of that. Let's do some films. <laughs> <laughs> still a bit raw on the state of the world right now. The kind of Fair masochist enough. is watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, any other thoughts before we move on to question of the week? Um, I was delighted by this. I was expecting it to be the minor of the two um, original Pixar films coming out this year. There's another one coming out in July. We're only a few months away, unusually, from another oh, Pixar yeah, film no. called Soul. Um, and that yeah. looks, if I had to guess, that's the next Pete Doctor film. He he of um, 
who have Inside Out and Open Monsters Inc. fame. So I'm really looking yeah. forward to that one. I did expect this to be sort of like um, average stuff, more in line with Monsters University than with Coco, and I was really pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair point to move on, would, uh, so to speak. Me. With... <laughs> Uh, so question of the week this week we, we took inspiration from Pixar's long history of deeply obsessing children uh, which is a noble pursuit when you do it in the right way and we asked what children's movie is least suitable for children so from Facebook we got we got a torrent on Facebook uh, Don Pallas says what Ship Down or The Dark Crystal? Both are pretty horrible films. Horrible as in scary slash creepy, not, you know, bad. Uh, those answers were echoed elsewhere. The Dark Crystal was the preferred choice of uh, our esteemed co-host Rob Simpson, who says the Skeksis are scary bird monsters for sure, but the reason I think it shouldn't be seen by kids is because it's boring. Remove the puppets and it's the most paint-by-numbers fantasy I've ever seen. Makes oh, Krull look like an all-timer. That took a turner. <laughs> wasn't yeah. It? <laughs> uh, he also says technically Roll Dahl adaptations, except I think Roll Dahl adaptations are movies that every kid should see. Hmm. Which uh, I think is fair enough. Uh, another person who echoed one of those answers, Mikey Toast, said what ship down, at which point uh, Adela Terrell again on Facebook said, all right, you win. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of the immediate, anyone plays this card wins really, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's unbeatable. It's famously a movie that the BBFC has got at least one complaint about yeah. Every year since it was released, yeah, it's patently unsuitable in every way for children, and yet <laughs> it's you know, if not a ritual, then an ordeal that uh, should be watched. Sandra Hill says, Darby O'Gill and the Little People gave me nightmares 60 years ago. I still remember the Banshee. Uh, pity we didn't ask this last week, or that could have tied into our Sean Connery yeah, perspective, of... yeah. yeah, synergy, synergy. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I have to say it that way. Shibble into ashes. <laughs> we shale into synergy. Splendid. Uh, Marilyn Jordan says, Alice in Wonderland terrified me. Doesn't specify which one, I assume, <laughs> if it was the... If it was the... <laughs> If it was the Disney one, that's quite a surprise. If it was the Jan Spankmeyer one, that's sort of expected. And if it was the Tim Burton one, it was probably because of the ending where Alice starts the Opium Wars. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got Alice in Wonderland stories for another time. Let's, <laughs> let's press on. <laughs> let's not get distracted. <laughs> Uh, Ashley Lane says Troll 2, I'm not actually certain that it was made by children because I have a very hard time trying to work out what its target audience actually was Did you say made by children or made for children? <laughs> both work Yeah, can, can't it be both? <laughs> Fair enough <laughs> Uh, Damon Skinner says I just watched Princess Mononoke I think that might be a contender yeah, that's just popped up in cinemas again this weekend, I think, hasn't it? Has it? Yeah, it had a very brief, um, I know um, there was a local cinema show in it yesterday afternoon. Found out the last oh, minute right. mind, so yeah, I didn't make it to that screen. Because of the Netflix acquisition, do you think? I'm, I'm not sure. It might be an anniversary mm. thing. Um, I know that this yeah. cinema has done these screenings of, um, of Ghibli films before. Oh, right. Yeah, I didn't know if it was a nationwide thing or if it was just local, but there they are. Yeah. Bao Bai says Pinocchio. That film is horrifying. I still have nightmares. In fact, a lot of Disney it used to have such a sinister, creepy undercurrent that really makes me go, ah, so that's why I'm messed up. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the scariest Pinocchio of all is the one that Roberto Benigni directed and starred in uh, just after he did Life is Beautiful. Oh, dear. <laughs> which really makes you wonder why the hell Gepetto made a sort of his real boy puppet look like a saggy 50-year-old man. <laughs> well, you know, we've, we we see these things recur over and over again, like Robert Downey Jr. has done it with Doolittle. We see these kind of projects <laughs> recur over time. All of this has happened before and will happen again. Uh, Mary Elizabeth says, Drop Dead Fred. I mean, it's PG-13, so perhaps not really a kid's movie, but I watched it as a kid, and having gone back and watched it as an adult, oof. 
I would argue that, that that does work for kids because if you, if you buy into the stupid slapstick of it when you're a kid, you can revisit it when you're older and you might have the reaction that all the smart people do where they go, oh, it's awful. But, you know, it's it, there is, <laughs> it, you do look at it and go, whoa, I was watching this when I was a kid. There is, the, you know, I think it's I think it's a 12 certificate, isn't it? It's not 15. Uh, I, yeah, I can't. I can't exactly remember. As yeah. you will note from the PG thirteen reference, Mary is American, uh, which oh. means that sh- she has got in on the ultimate like British childhood experience of yours and my generation, which is watching horrendously inappropriate things starring Rick Mail when you're a kid. Pretty much, yeah. Just externalizing abuse and getting rid of the people who abused <laughs> you by bringing back Rick Mail. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it's not a bad plan as uh, it goes. Let's, we should we should look into that in general. <laughs> it, the, the, yeah, there's got to be a way we can make this happen. In the, week <laughs> the, in the week that onward came out, let's just get this sorted. Bring back Rick Mill for twenty four hours to get it all sorted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and finally, Bill Holton just says erase it. <laughs> Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, demonstrably true. <laughs> not too, I mean, I, not suitable I, for children. <laughs> I quibble with this. I think a razor head is much worse if you're a parent than a child. Am I saying that a razor head is suitable for children? Yes, I seem to have backed myself into this corner. Hmm. Do I feel good about that? Not very, but still. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I don't really have an answer for this because I... Uh, I, I, I'm sure I've mentioned this before on the show, but I took a long time to come to films. I just found particularly like Disney and Spielberg schmaltzy and boring as a kid. I've changed my view on it a bit now, I guess. But uh, So I don't have that visceral sense of, oh my God, they show kids this, because I don't really remember what it was like to be a kid who watched films. So mm. yeah, um, I guess my answer's Cannibal Holocaust. Well, I can speak to... Um, I can speak to the thing about Roald Dahl adaptations because it's, it's Nicholas Rugg's um, adaptation of The Witches that people go back oh. to most often, isn't it? Like, that's, God, you, yeah. Oh yeah, which which going to get the guy who did Don't Look Now to do The Witches? <laughs> Cracking idea. The 80s were wild. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the weird thing, the reason why I can't buy into that fully is where, where I get that the Jim Henson prosthetics, uh, you know, to a certain age of view are absolutely horrific and they do really stand up as really scary, is that what Nicholas Rogue did was um, take out the, you know, he kind of took out the ending of it, whereas the... Mm. Yeah, it can't. It's the, the thing that Roald Dahl was famously incensed about with this is that the spoilers for the witches, by the way. Um, <laughs> if if you've never read the witches, it ends with um, the, the main character being turned into a mouse, um, and they mm. eventually vanquish the Grand High Council of um, of witches and and whatnot, and carry on going around the world f- killing witches um, as a granny and mouse pair, which is a mint way yeah. to end any book. And um, the film taunted this down. It was Rogue's idea to tone it down, and Dahl absolutely lost it he was furious and he's ruined it so you know in many ways it just sort of unbalances the 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 heart it does i get it i don't I'm not sure what it does because it's a tamer ending than the book is what i'm saying so like i don't yeah as as i do you... think if you if you stop nicholas rogues the witch is about two minutes before the ending it might just be the greatest role dial adaptation but yeah i do agree yeah, that the, is the, the bottom does really fall out of it and that, exactly as you said the very last yeah. two minutes of it so you know for me it's not um it's a film i can imagine distressing kids what i'm actually going to answer is brian levant's the flintstones from 1994, <laughs> um, which is, is I've recently revisited this for for another job, but it's as near as I can tell the um, the kind of adult baby boomer equivalent of those really cynical kids films that are just like colours and noise. Like this is this what I'll do. Yeah, it's just it's just gags about mothers in law and Halle Berry's cleavage just to keep like adult baby boomers <laughs> occupied for a little while. It's just yeah, it's this film that's like lovely to look at and just insanely terrible to watch. Because it's because it, it's for whatever. It, oh, I know, I know. It'll be a really good family film, like revamp of the Flintstones, corporate satire. What we're going to do is going to make an anti-capitalist film that is the most, also simultaneously the most cravenly commercial. Uh, Steven Spielberg <laughs> produced but not directed Saturday Night Live sketch extended beyond all reasonable limits. This is one of the things, isn't it? If we're talking about things that are unsuitable for children, I guess I've been thinking about it in a sort of sex violence language kind of way. Yeah. Whereas what I should be thinking about is all those bloody films where someone gets magic powers or something and they use it to get a promotion at work. <laughs> it's like, why, why do they think children are interested in that? Yeah, there's just so many Jim Carrey movies that aren't liar liar. 
that just came after yes. that. <laughs> oh, right, well, now he has to say yes to everything, and now he has to do this. And... Now he has to say care for some penguins. And yeah. There's a hedgehog or something. I don't know. I don't understand <laughs> this world we live in anymore. Oh, God, I, I would love Sonic the Hedgehog so much more if Dr. Robotnik just wanted a promotion. Yeah, he's medical student Robotnik. <laughs> <laughs> and only by knacking this hedgehog and he, I don't know, just, <laughs> type, you know, write it, print it, so it'll make some money, it'll be fine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've, I've wound up being quite cynical about kids' films. Um, there are plenty of, I think, that in general, kids' films that are frightening in terms of, you know, in a, it being inappropriate in terms of frightening, this is too scary. I think that a little bit of horror is good for kids, especially like, yeah. you know, Laika is, and their films, uh, the only things that really like picked up the mantle of that really there's um you know stuff like Coraline and Parandorm and it's just these weird horror films that get the structure of horror films and can be kids first horror films so you I know I suppose yeah if, if we're talking about sort of things that scared for kids the big sort of children's movie franchise of this century so far has been Harry Potter which has quite a lot of that stuff in yeah like horror is quite Nicely bedded into that in the same way that the Who Done It, Agatha Christie type yeah. stuff is bedded into it. It's you know, I mean, when you're looking at inappropriate stuff, I go to the Flintstones because it is normally these follies of people going and making family movies um, that are just not really just interested in kids in any way. Really, mm. <laughs> there's nothing about the Flintstones that's interested in kids. You know, like, um, yeah. You, you, um, I was recently thinking about this as well that um, Kindergarten Cop is a film that opens like the first ten minutes of it are more or less like the Terminator. It's it's like Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> as a cop going and busting drug dealers, and it's the sort of thing yeah. that earned it a fifteen over a PG thirteen if you're in the states. But you know, and then turns it into this film where you put an Arnold Schwarzenegger in a room full of children and say, "Oh, I'm sorry, who was this for again?" <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I, I quite like Kindergarten Cop, sorry, but it, it just opens that weird 10 minutes. And that's the sort of thing I think that pops, crops up a lot in films yeah. that, um, you know, that uh, directors who normally work for grown ups suddenly come about with when they, they move into a family film. So if you're enjoying what you're listening to, you can donate to our Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash The Geek Show and help us keep making these podcasts. We're also moving heavily into YouTube with several new features on our official The Geek Show YouTube channel. You can find us on Facebook and keep up with all this stuff just by searching Facebook for The Geek Show. And we are on Twitter at TGS underscore The Geek Show. I'm Christopher Sabat, the voice of Roanoa Zorro, and you're listening to The Geek Show on thegeekshow.co.uk dot what up unsure if your spider-man is amazing or spectacular infinitely confused by crisis on infinite earths or does the mere thought of x-men continuity make you tremble then four panel is the podcast for you join me andrew and my co-host rob and mick as we guide you through the weird and wild world of comics we'll talk about the secret origins of your favorite characters delve into the craziest events of comics past and review the hottest new graphic novels that you might have missed. That's Four Panel, a part of the Geek Show Podcast Network, available wherever podcasts are found. Uh, I quite enjoyed that Simpsons thing. I thought I depressed the hell out of me. I <laughs> thought it was well, an absolute pasteurization a bland corporate shell of something I once loved well the Disney welcomes the Simpsons thing wasn't a promising start yeah but they did do another shot with Maggie about seven years ago in front of something else and I thought if the Simpsons like goes away like I don't know how much of the newest stuff you've seen but if, like, if the Simpsons goes Almost away in its not. current form I'd be alright with this like continuing like this sort of silent comedy type thing I found it charming okay. but then I'm a mark for that <laughs> <laughs> Right, uh, if you do go to thegeekshow.co.uk, as we mentioned, you can see some of our new reviews. Rob has reviewed Raining in the Mountain, another King Hume movie that uh, from a director he loves so much. I, meanwhile, have stepped outside of my comfort zone into a big bear trap marked, oh God, how do you pronounce this name, uh, with a film by Hiroshi Teshigahara, uh, the director of Woman in the Dunes, Face of Another and many other paranoid Japanese sci-fi classics. I was reviewing Criterion's reissue of his very uncharacteristic documentary about Antonio Gaudi, the Catalan architect, which is simply called Antonio Gaudi. So uh, that's what's on our site. 
We've also got a review by Mick of Eureka's release of Syncopation by William Dieterle, which comes out next week, and I caught up with him a bit earlier about that. So we got a disc through from Eureka that Mick sounded so ill-suited to review that we just had to force him to review it, and that's Syncopation, is it not? It is indeed Syncopation, um, which is a love story about jazz. Right, okay. <laughs> which is so not me, yeah. it's untrue. Not a big fan of La La Land? No, because it's a musical, Graham, and as you know, I'm allergic to them. <laughs> yes. The thing is, it's not that I hate jazz. Mm. My name's not Johnny. <laughs> well, well, welcome to any of our listeners who are under 45. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I hate jazz. I hate pretentious jazz, you know, the sort of free-blown, oh, yeah. mm. improvised, every track takes about four hours to yes. to finish and sounds like three different tunes yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. It's that kind of jazz I hate. What we've got here is more your big band sound jazz, the development of that. So it all almost feels like it's just a, a continual series of 1920s film scores. Right. Rather than anything else. Yeah. So it's actually quite a tolerable film. Mm. And it does really trace the development of jazz. Right. Uh, and I was a bit wary of it at first, but I thought, no, this is going to be treated sympathetically from the very first scene. It's a bit of an odd opening because it feels a bit like a sort of Alan Quatermain style epic when the credits roll at the beginning, because it's that sort of um, almost carved stone cartouche type Oh, credit yeah. sequence yeah, with a, a film score that it's like some very ominous drumming in the background. Journey to the centre of jazz. That's the, that's the kind of vibe you get. Hmm, tribal. That's fine mm -hmm. because we actually start off, we fade from that and the list of people who are going to be in the film. Um, we go from that to a scene of tribal dancing in Africa. Mm -hmm. We know it's Africa by the simple fact that we get a superimposed globe with Africa written across Aha. the middle, um, which is fine. That was de rigueur for a certain era of movie to show that we're in a certain location. We'll show a globe. Yes. Um, and later we'll draw a map with a dotted line to show that we're moving. Um, so the thing with this film is it starts there. And you think, oh, great, they're going to talk about the black roots of jazz music. Mm. And they do. We then cut to a white man in a hut overlooking the scene of tribal dancing that we saw earlier. And he's surrounded by chests. And that's our first downbeat moment of the entire piece. Uh, because he opens the chest and not is he surrounded by the riches of his imperial um, plunder. Plunder. But he's got just chests and chests full of iron shackles. Ooh, trappy. Wow, that's grim. Yeah. But we'll gloss over that. Literally, it's a, like a five-second shot. Mm. And then another five-second shot of some um, African slaves being transported on a ship. Uh, and then we end up in New Orleans. We know we're in New Orleans because... Is it a globe? Yeah. <laughs> Not only that, but it's a slightly spinning globe that shows the passage from the Africas to the Americas. Hmm. Bouncy. And then we get into the, the actual sort of plot because in order to tell the story of jazz and its development and America's love of jazz, hmm. uh, we parallel it with a sort of love story of its own. Yeah. Uh, and we start off in New Orleans with the Latimer family. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Latimer is an architect and has done some big building designs. And his daughter is a gifted piano player who soaked up the sounds of New Orleans and plays basically jazz, early jazz, on mm -hmm. the piano. Yeah. Um, she has friends. Uh, 
one of which is her nanny's son, and her nanny is very much like the character of Mammy Two Shoes in Tom and Jerry. Right. But made real. Yeah. Uh, and it's called Ella. She's the housekeeper, and she's very much that sort of deep south. We've got out of slavery. We're, we're more indentured servants than slaves now. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got, uh, black people have got jobs, mm. but it's boot boy and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but her son is a gifted cornet player. Mm. I mean, naturally gifted. All the money that Ella earns, she spends on sending her son to music college. And he can't read music. He just, it just makes no sense to him. Yeah. But improvise, he can do that till the cows come home. Mm. He then gets taken under the wing of a legendary cornet player who plays the basically the, the Mississippi run of towns, just up and down all the time touring and playing CD clubs. And in the meantime, uh, some business associates of Mr. Latimer mm-hmm. come down from Chicago and make him an offer he can't refuse, dragging his daughter Kit away from her muse and inspiration. Right. And we then forget about the black origins of jazz for a while. Yeah. We see years later uh, that... Kit is in a relationship with uh, the son of her father's business partner, Paul. Uh, He doesn't really like the jazz, but it's clear that the two of them are an item. Mm. And one night, it's her birthday, but no one can stay at home to celebrate with her because uh, they've got a big business meeting to attend. Mm -hmm. And she goes for a wander, and she meets Johnny. Johnny Shoemaker. Although it's written Schumacher whenever you see it, but they always refer to him as Johnny Shoemaker. (laughs) Right. Because that sounds so jazz. Yes. He too is a horn player um, in a high school band who never really left high school. They didn't graduate properly, so they never found jobs, so they just carry on playing their instruments and earning whatever they can in whatever clubs they can. And they strike up a friendship. It's clear that Johnny's smitten with Kit. Uh, We then move on, and it's wartime, and Paul gets sent off to the front line. Yeah. Uh, And Kit doesn't hear back. And then the parades come. She she finally finds out that he's died on the front lines and uh, is bereft. Uh, But Johnny's still in town, mainly because he's a draft dodger, but we gloss over that. (laughs) <laughs> quite a lot. He does spend some time in jail. You don't see his arrest or anything. Yeah. But you do see him hiding under a table in a cafe when they come to do the draft. Stealthy. Um, He gets out of jail and eventually him and Kit start having a relationship and they get married. Mm. And he gets the chance to play in a big band doing the old jazz stuff. Um, And it infuriates him because it's a proper conducted orchestra. Ah, stuff. thanks. Meanwhile, there's a parade in town for the end of the war, mm. and Ella's son comes to town. And this is this is another the bits that refer to to the black characters in this are what really rankle. I mean, I know it's a uh, 1942 movie, yeah, but oh, reviewing it by our standards, it's uncomfortable viewing. Yeah, because whilst when the parade comes to town. Mm. Her daughter, Reg, mm. no, sorry, her son, Reg, we'll edit that, yeah? <laughs> when the parade comes to town, her son, Reg, mm. is leading the band that leads the parade and he's stood up in the motorcade and he's playing his cornet like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. She dies of what looks like a heart attack very quietly and her last words are, is Reg there? And that's it. We don't mourn her. Yeah. Although she's been a really important part of Kit's life and a really important part of Kit's father's life Just for, the, like, uh, 20 years. Yeah. And it's like, you know, Kit t- bends down and says, are you all right? And she says, is my son doing well? And, and that's it. Just another tragic cornet-related fatality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but we soon get over that death. <laughs> <laughs> and... Eventually, we get 
a progression of different types of jazz, a, a sort of north-south divide of jazz. Mm. Uh, Johnny Schumacher manages to make a success of his career as a jazz player. Um, and then we get the big finale performance where we have this uh, jazz band made up of the, the great and the good of 1920s and 30s jazz, the Benny Goodmans, uh, Charlie Barnett, Harry James, Jack Jenny, Gene Cooper, Alvino Ray. I think Gene Cooper is the drummer, and I think he may be Keith Moon's dad. <laughs> um, Joe Venuti, Emery Parnell, and this is the bit that's really uncomfortable because we make this big thing at the beginning of the movie that, you know, it all goes back to these black tribal dances. Mm. And at the end of it, every major jazz musician that's in it is a white middle-class male. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, cultural appropriation doesn't even begin to, <laughs> to sum it up. Mm. grabby. And it, it, it's, the, it's true because Ella and Reg are really important characters in the first sort of 10, 20 minutes of the film. Mm. Now, it's only an hour and a half, you know, it's 88 minutes. But they're basically not even in it from like, about an hour and ten in. Yeah. And we've moved on from the origin of jazz. Yeah. Um, which is true, but if you actually look at footage of big bands from that time, there was always a smattering of black musicians in them. Yeah, yeah. You and and, and that. that's lost. So it's it's one of those films where you think if if it was made now and you had someone like a Ryan Coogler at the, the helm. Yeah. You could really get the origin of jazz, but get across that message of it bringing people together. Mm. Because, you know, ultimately this is about America's love affair with jazz. Yeah. In the early part of the 20th century. And it, it's probably one of the things that allowed civil rights movements to build and become successful because mm. from the jazz, we then get the rock and the roll. The, the, rock the rock and, and the roll. To a lesser extent, the, the, the roll. roll. The rock and the roll. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> as my dad used to call it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, um, I think the weirdest part about this entire movie was how excited I got up once again seeing the RKO Radio Pictures logo at the beginning. Okay. Because I see it so rarely these days. Hmm. Trivial. But, yeah, it... it it's not a bad movie. If you don't like jazz, it's still a decent movie to watch. It's just that uncomfortable feeling you get from the sidelining of the uh, African Americans yeah. in it. Yeah. So, so that's uh, Syncopation, uh, directed by William Dieterle, and uh, yeah, it it was far more enjoyable than I expected. Good, because I didn't expect it to be at all enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> gentlemen your promised james bond content oh yeah um <laughs> i just probably should have had a different um intro to that maybe maybe put some jingle in i don't know oh yeah anyway <laughs> so um in last week's um episode i was talking about the sean connery era um as abbreviated and jumpy as it was all over the place sort of originally runs from 1962 up to 67 so you only live twice and then carried on again in uh, Diamonds Are Forever in 1971. In between that, it's 1969. The space opera has just been introduced to Britain, and in the US, the man is landing on the moon. And for one night only, George Lazenby is playing James Bond 007 in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Before we get into talking about the film, Graham, have you ever heard anything about the cast? How Lazenby was cast in the role? Uh, I, I know that he was a male model. That's about the limit of it. Okay, so um, when Sean Connery announced that the fifth one was going to be his last. Um, his last installment there. Basically, um, yeah. there, it was there was never any chance that Albert Broccoli was going to wrap up the series there. Uh, I'll repeat what I quoted last week. He told Alan Wicker in an interview back in 1967, we will in our own way try to continue the Bond series for the audience because it's too important. So they immediately cast the net out to um, find a new Bond. The actors they were first looking at, uh, or rather the first actors who auditioned, were a couple of TV treasures. Uh, firstly, Peter Purves, auditioned fresh off his stint oh. on Doctor Who and then weirdly Peter Snow as in Master of the Swingometer also auditioned <laughs> for the role 
Okay. Yeah, Oliver Reed was under consideration, but at that point he was considered uh, to be too rough for the role. It'd be a lot more in tune with the sort of um, the Daniel Craig trail today, I think. Nobody does it drunker. Yeah, Terence Stamp revealed in 2013 that he lost out on the role after discussions with Eon because uh, he wanted to dis- differentiate himself from Sean Connery by starting the movie wearing the Japanese makeup that um, uh, Connery had worn in You Want to Live Twice, so he basically wanted to play it uh, as a Japanese man for half of the movie. <laughs> Incredibly. <laughs> and best of all, this is it, somehow it gets funnier than that. My absolute favourite story is that um, Cobby Broccoli ran up Dick Van Dyke uh, off the back of... Because um, uh, Ch- he'd appeared in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which is based on Ian Fleming novel. Right. Um, and during their phone conversation, Dick Van Dyke pointed out that he'd had very bad reviews for his English accent in Mary Poppins, to which Broccoli said, mm. oh, that's right, forget it, and hung up right there and then. <laughs> So when it comes down to, uh, oh, instantly there was an actor called Timothy Dalton in consideration at one point as well, but he ruled himself out, even though he was a fan of the books, because he felt he was too young. Sure, he'll never come uh, whatever again. happened to that guy? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so um, when it comes down to like final auditions, George Lesenby uh, is a guy who, who blacked his way in, essentially, as a male model with no previous acting experience. Um, and he somehow wound up being cast in the darkest and most emotional entry in the Bond franchise up to that point. Um, he managed to beat out established actors uh, John Richardson, Anthony Rogers and Robert Campbell were among the ones who were in the final auditions uh, who were asked to carry out an uh, action-packed screen test. Uh, Lesnar mm-hmm. got the part because he got carried away and actually punched the stunt coordinator. Not necessarily needed <laughs> to, um, but the producers went, oh, he's got what it takes. He's, he's really into this. Um, so that's how, in short, George Lesnar got that's, cast. <laughs> yeah, that's what you do at an audition, listeners. Yeah. So um, Lesnar only ended up acting in one film um, we'll get to. I should probably get to it now. He basically was advised by his agent after Honor Majesty's Secret Service came out that uh, this Bond thing isn't going to last much longer, so you should probably just cut it off at one. <laughs> so he he, he fantastically um, managed to quit right after the first, right after Honor Majesty's Secret Service comes out. And this is a film that's you know the lays and be is you know is because of a common byword, perhaps perhaps because of press coverage, but. In fairness, also due to his performance, um, it's kind of become mm. a byword for you know just a slightly rubbish performance of someone who has one go in a franchise. You know, it's why we call the fourth Bond movie the one without Matt Damon, the Bond Lazenby, for instance. <laughs> um, so you know, it's it's um, the plot such as it is for a Bond film. Um, you've got um, Blofeld first appeared in You Only Live Twice, played by Donald Pleasant. Uh, it's now mm. regenerated somehow, but you know, in any case, it's disappeared <laughs> for two years since that film. Uh, came out. Yeah. Um, we let it learn, of course, because it's a strange experience. Um, while he's while Bond is out and about looking for uh, Blofeld, he encounters the Contessa Teresa uh, Di Vincenzo, uh, Tracy Shot, who's um, who he reckons might have some information, or her father, who's a mob boss, might have some information about Blofeld's where, whereabouts. Uh, MI6 relieves him from his mission, though, at this crucial juncture, uh, prompting him to go rogue for the first time in the series. He goes undercover as a genealogist to a mountaintop base. You remember those? Where Blofeld appears to be researching <laughs> allergies. Um, all the while, though, there's this undercurrent of um, romance between him and Tracy, who's played by Diana Rick, as uh, Bond becomes more and more fixated on Stop Inspector for once and for all. Uh, what do you reckon to this film, uh, Graham? Just so it's not me, random- so it's not just me rambling. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've not watched it in a very long time, but I remember it being really having a sort of epic feel that even Bond does not always have. I remember the ski slopes chase being fantastic. I remember it has one of those. So every time I think back to sixties Bond, or at least sort of Connery the Bond, I always remember it in terms of oh yeah, there's one jarringly horrible bit, isn't there? Like the bikini strangulation in Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah. And in this one, it it's definitely the end of that ski chase with the guy going into the chipper. How did we manage to get through the whole conversation about films that aren't appropriate for kids without mentioning the Bond movies? I'm not sure how, but anyway. It's a fair point. But anyway, yeah. here's another PG movie, <laughs> which <laughs> the end people killed and bonked left, right and centre. Um, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned the ski slope. That is the thing that's come up for... Um, the, the film in general has come in for reassessment in more recent years. Because my, mm. my, my look at this would be that it's the... You know, it's one of the very best Bond films. It's just unfortunate yeah. that it has arguably the weakest... Bond performer in the, in the lead mm. role. It's and it's not that he's bad. It's just different. He's he's very different from Connery. It's the most human version of the character up until 
like the Timothy Dalton and Daniel Craig versions of the role. If there's anything that makes him look bad in it, it's it's the insistence that he wear cravats in his costume for some reason. Like that just suddenly starts happening. That feels like <laughs> it just feels like they're for Austin Powers to pick up in thirty years' time. And you know, there's yes. the, there's the very contemporary speeding up of fight sequences, which at the same time is to cover the fact that once you know, once Lazenby's not connecting he's not very convincing in a fight scene as much um it, it's a long film i'll say that much so it's 135 minutes long and mm. so maybe that's another reason they were speeding up the action to try and make it shorter maybe, but, yeah. yeah no possibly um but yeah he's his performance is there but what really swings this as like a really interesting film it's really worthy of reassessment despite its reputation i would say is, is tracy is diana riggs performance she is bar none the best like leading lady in the franchise up until you know, the, the 21st century films where D- under Daniel Craig, you know, he insists to produce the female characters have to actually matter. Um, yeah. So, you, so there's that. She is fantastic in this thing. This ski slope chase that's remembered so well is not, you know, like Bond chasing after baddies. It's not a traditional, unflappable Bond sequence. It's Bond skiing for his life. It's Bond trying desperately to escape after he's been caught out by countless goons. At the end of that chase, he's in a village where he comes as close to breaking his sweat and of course to have been, as close to being murdered by the baddies as he ever does in any of these films. And it's Tracy's mm-hmm. um, sudden appearance at that moment that, you know, rescues him, essentially. Like, she, she's, you know, in all the ways, uh, all the PR gubbins that you ha- you've had about movies since uh, since Goldeneye, about how, you know, the, the Bond girl is a core lead oh, yeah. this time. This is a film that puts his money where its mouth is. You know, I don't think Diana Rigg yeah. would have had it any other way, really. She wouldn't have put up with any of this nonsense. Uh, straight off the Avengers, wasn't she? Yeah, at the exactly. time? Yeah, straight yeah. off Emma Peel. And not mm. not that Avengers, by the way, baby listeners. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> um, on the film in front, you've got Blofeld um, regenerating into Telly Savalas. Uh, it makes me wonder, really, how we, how on earth he and Bond recognise each other at all, because one of them used to look like Sean Connery, and the other one used to look like Donald Pleasance, but we'll, we'll put that aside for a second. Um, upon, yes. upon revisiting it, Telly Savalas is unexpectedly the best Blofeld. You know, it, it, right. D- Donald, Donald Pleasance is the one who, um, who you know, Mike Myers bases Dr. Evil on, most yeah. obviously. Um, so there's, as much as that detracts from Pleasance, you know, in, in pop culture terms, Savalas is still like a, a more immediately threatening, a more a more physical, physically imposing mm-hmm. um, take on the character. You know, he gets involved in the action right up to the end. He just have a typically ridiculous plot, but also quite a good one, I guess. He's um, a timely one, if you will. He's um, basically messing about with uh, allergies in order to create a global pandemic of some kind. It never happened. There's... <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag no, we're not getting into those hashtags. I think it's I don't think it's any of those things. But there's <laughs> I'm not getting into any actual conspiracy theories. It was just a topical reference gone awry. Anyway, um he, his plan of course involves having a mountain top base full of sexy women who are allergic to things and Bond just caught, sort of keeps stumbling into them and having sex with them while apparently being undercover. But then this is a secret agent who constantly says, Hello, I am Bond, James Bond, wherever he goes. <laughs> yes. So it's a secret agent's goes. It's not that good. But what I'm, what this film brings to it that the films were lacking by the time Connery uh, took took a bow for the first time is it, it's got real jeopardy to it. You know, as I said, mm. there's the scene with the ski, the ski slope scene, the scene in the village that follows. There's real danger. Lesenby's inexperience works in his favour in these scenes because you know it, it's a very different take from Connery. And you know, they, they have the famous line in the pre-title sequence where. Um, instead of hopping into bed with him, Diana Rick jumps in a car and drives off, and he looks straight down at the camera and says, "This wouldn't have happened to the other fella." And yes, it's almost like I don't think he was directed to look down the camera. I think it was just possible they just shot that really early on, and he's just doing that <laughs> by this point. You know, it's like it's it. I, I kind of want to defend Lesnar, but he's fair game, really, considering the way it goes on. You know, talking about it, saying, "Oh, being James Bond, I was uh, sleeping with about four or five women a day back in those days. That's normal for a fit young bloke like me." It's like, "Oh, it's sort of Lazenby." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, point being, it's very well directed all the way through by uh, Peter R. Hunt. Uh, directed this one. Um, aside, you know, aside from the the bits, as I say, are possibly to cover up Lazenby's um, lack of on screen fight prowess when he's not connecting. Um, <laughs> You know, it's the requirements of this story is that Bond is out of his element, and whatever Connery was, it wasn't that. Yeah. And the relationship that he and Diane Rigg build together is fantastic, and it's important to this one. You know, uniquely to this film for reasons that we'll get into in for a second. Um, but it's got, for one thing, the most unique ending of any of the Bond films. It's you know, it's not the couple mm. getting lost at sea and making out. 
uh, or you know any of the usual gubbins. Uh, if you not skip past the next couple of minutes, by the way, if you've never seen this and don't want to know what happens, uh, this is the film that ends with Bond uh, getting married to Tracy. Mm. Uh, they have a big wedding where Money Penny comes and Q comes and M comes. Everyone's everyone's at the wedding and everyone's having a lovely time and it's kind of quite quite nice. He drives off with his new bride, um, and then she's gone down. At the side of the road, she's assassinated by Blofeld at the very end of the film, mm. and it's the, the the moment that is inarguably Lesnarby's best in the film is his reaction to that is him just simply quietly mourning, just reacting to that, and we don't get the big bombastic Monty Norman score going to the credits, and it's a really bold and dark ending, and does it it, mm. it really puts the capstone the you know the capstone on this really emotionally much darker um, instalment. Um, I should mention as well that you know this is the only Bond film that doesn't have, um, bar like the instrumental pieces, this is the only one that doesn't have its theme song in the opening title sequence. This uh, the theme song of this one is "We Have All the Time in the World" by Louis Armstrong, and it features Which in it. Is... Yeah, it features in a, a genuinely romantic. You know, there's a in, sort of interlude, a montage um, with Bond and Tracy that and it is and genuinely affecting. You wouldn't expect everyone it always. Everyone always forgets that that song was written for a Bond film because of yeah. it. I think that if that song had played during the opening credits, all of those debates about what the best Bond theme is would be a lot shorter. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's it, it's the qualities you want for it. I do think it ranks among the best songs ever written for a Bond film. Um, mm. I think I think it should go for its own, but it's. Yeah, I mean, it's a very different film. It's not what you want every single time, but it gets all of the action stuff so right early on as well. You know, in- Inception famously pays homage to the, the ski chase that we-, we keep mentioning. The difference is in Inception is after Tom Hardy gets chased down the slope, he climbs all the way back up and brays everybody. But then that's just what, <laughs> that's just what Tom Hardy's going to do, really. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff to recommend this. We've, we've you know, we've covered the spoiler um, detail. That's it's, it, it's the reason yeah. why this keeps coming back around because we're now in the place where um, No Time to Die has, for a change, um, a, a leading lady return. Like Leia Sadu is coming back from from the last film, and Respected, and, and yeah. yeah, and it's automatically the language of this franchise is such that everyone thinks, oh, they're going to do a new On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and mm. needn't necessarily be the case. For one thing, it would take people remembering Spectre. Um, so you know, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how they're, we'll they're going to cross that. It's another seven months for people to forget Spectre and they're going to really directly follow it up. Anyway, <laughs> that's for the Daniel Craig thing. So my point being, um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service is a really underrated Bond film. And it's underrated for a reason. It's because it's got the weakest of the Bond performances in it. But it's hard to think of anyone who was around you know, for another 20 years after that who could have done it as well as Lazenby does. You have to be vulnerable mm. in that performance. And he's he strikes the balance well enough for what it is. Fantastic. Yeah. Right. We're going to talk about Roger Moore next week, by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's ups and downs there. <laughs> Yes, coming out next week. Uh, we'll start. We'll start on the day you're probably listening to this, listeners. On Wednesday, there's a couple of big releases out. There's Bloodshot with uh, old Ed- oh. Edward Petrel. Uh, that's never. Is that finally coming out? That's coming out. Yeah, I've not seen... I didn't realise. Had not... it been delayed? <laughs> it was one of these vague things that sounded like a joke. Like, you know, the old Simpsons thing, putting your hand up going, is this a joke? And they're going, no, it's definitely yeah. not a joke. And so we're just asking the same. Like, that's out this week. That's out this week. Wow. It's based on a comic book series I've never heard of. So I yeah. hope the guy's name is, like, Darren Bloodshot or something like that. Yeah. Darren Bloodshot. Uh, <laughs> it's a secret identity. He goes, goes, <laughs> goes and writes for a newspaper under the byline, Darren Bloodshot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it looks pretty ropey. Um, speaking of things that have been delayed for a while, uh, the free speech warriors of the right were somehow weirdly silent when the film got canned because Donald Trump found it offensive. But now it's back out. Uh, must be because of all that tireless lobbying by Spiked Online and the like that I just didn't see for some reason. Mm. Uh, but that's The Hunt, directed by uh, Compliance's Craig Zobel with Emma Roberts and Hilary Swank. I'm really good. I'm really glad this is um, this is coming out that this has actually got a release. It's a little, you know, it's not shouldn't it's not exactly unexpected that they've now brought it back around and gone the film of the year is the one that nobody has seen. It's like well, yes, you could 
put that on literally anything. <laughs> like, literally, <no> <laughs> I mean, it's technically true of anything, but you know, fair fair play to them for cashing in on the hype. I mean, it's not yeah. actually, I'm glad it's not just getting like a straight to VOD, you know, like quietly sort of shoveled out. So I'm interested to see where this goes. Yeah. It's that there are a few things out next week that form odd, like unexpected double bills, and the hunt shares a loose basis in the most dangerous game, a classic mm. story of people hunting, uh, with a film that's out on Friday, Kleber Mendoza Fillo's Baccarat. Oh, wow. I've heard a lot about this, but I didn't know that's what it was about, the most dangerous game style thing. It, it seems to be about a whole load of different things, so much so that whenever I look it up on Letterboxd, the genre classification seems to have changed. <laughs> it's always like about seven different genres, but no one can decide which seven different genres it is. That's good. I like a bit of genre flux. Yes, absolutely. Uh, good cast of Sonny Braga and Udo Kia are in this one. Uh, another unexpected double bill, uh, ballet movies. There's Cunningham, a uh, documentary biopic by Alka Cogvin, and and then we danced. Uh, uh, there's Calm with Horses, a new Irish drama starring one of those... One of those young actors who's really defined himself as being reliably good in everything in a very short space of time, really. I think Barry Keegan. Massive, like, massively... Sort of like a massive range of, of films as well. Like thinking, I'm just thinking back to Killing of a Sacred Deer. That was him, wasn't it? it was, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, that was him. He's got a nice weird taste. I like that as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of weird tastes, there is a reissue of one of David Lynch's career landmarks. The Elephant Man is 40 years old this year. It's an embarrassing blind spot. I've not seen The Elephant Man. I'm going to have to get around to it, aren't I? Especially if they're re-releasing it, it's nice and convenient. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it's marvellous, but then you'd probably guess that vaguely, hadn't you? But do you think think it's suitable for children, though, Graham? (laughs) (laughs) I I remember seeing stills of John Hurt as The Elephant Man when I was young and being really scared, but I think had I watched the film, I would have, you know, tolerated that. Oh, I would have just been a really divvy kid who didn't get the obvious <laughs> message of the film. That's also a possibility. Yeah. Well, the David Lynch Movies for Juniors season continues this half time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, another movie for children, which, I don't know, could be could be suitable for them. I haven't seen it yet, is My Spy with Dave Batista. You know what we were saying earlier on about Kindergarten Cop? Like, and yeah. Was, yeah, this is a 12-year film, and it's like... Who is this for? <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. doesn't look at all. Like, I remember seeing a trailer for it in front of some kids' film or other about nine months back. I think it got pushed back yeah. from last August for some reason. And yeah, that, I saw a TV spot for it the other day that had the 12 air thing. I was like, oh, blimey. <laughs> yeah, that is quite weird. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think I'm going to see it, but I, I do love Dave Batista. So. Yeah, I like, I like Dave Batista in anything, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, and finally, there's uh, another pretty wide release with another very starry cast, Misbehaviour, with Keira Knightley, Gugu and Bartha Raw, Jesse Buckley, Reese Evans, Greg Kinnear, Leslie Manville and Keely Hawes. I'm quite looking forward to that one as well. I'm enjoying this because I haven't actually looked up in advance what's up, what's coming out on Friday for once, so this is all... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to be going to the cinema a lot this weekend, I think. <laughs> a fun voyage of discovery, Yes. Uh, so it's a pretty rich set of things out, uh, a lot of promising things, and Bloodshot. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think we have decided, uh, me and Rob, who will be on next week, we have decided to back her out. Not, because... not Bloodshot. <laughs> not Bloodshot, you have to, no. You're not going to go and find out if he has like that Guardian byline, but it's just like um, it's just Vin Diesel <laughs> in glasses and a vest. And it's just something like, you could afford more like cars a... if you didn't buy avocados. Like every single newspaper byline, it's a photograph of the journalist taken about 30 years ago when they looked less decrepit. <laughs> Darren yeah. Bloodshot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it is Baccarat, which I'm really excited about. Uh, Philo's, I don't know if it was his first film or just his breakthrough film, but Neighbouring Sounds, the film he did in 2012, was oh. really striking and eerie. <laughs> Uh, I didn't expect watching it that he would be going in to do like seriously violent action, 
But then I don't know to what extent Baccarat was an action film. Like I say, it seems to be a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, so that's all very exciting. But until next week when we come back with Baccarat, uh, that's been a lot from Cinema Collectica. I've been Graham. I've been Mark. See you next week. Bye-bye.